from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Here's today's lineup. K-State's Romulo Lulato will talk about considerations when making wheat replanting decisions. He'll go over the general circumstances where reseeding a wheat stand might be in order. And he'll talk of an informational aid to help in that decision. Then K-State's A.J. Sharda will provide an update on his research into robotic infield systems for controlling weeds and insects in standing field crops. He'll talk about the capabilities of these autonomous vehicles and the next developmental step toward making them practical for crop pest control. And on this week's horticulture segment, K-State's Raymond Cloyd on controlling spider mites right now in landscape spruce and other conifers. All that ahead on this Agriculture Today. Good to have you aboard once more for another Agriculture Today. Well, around this time of the year, we tend to keep our next guest quite busy here on the broadcast as we have embarked on another winter wheat production season in Kansas. We're joined once more by wheat production specialist Romulo Lolato of K-State Research and Extension. But this time, Romulo, to offer some thoughts on whether or not to replant a winter wheat stand, which may not have gotten off to a strong start. And this is not a casual decision by any means. Producers have already sunk the costs of the initial planting. They need to think this through thoroughly, first of all, don't they? Most definitely, Eric. So there are many things that go into taking this decision of uh, replanting wheat, right? So so overall, we would give like a, just a general condition of the crop around the state right as of now and what mm-hmm. I'm hearing from growers. For the most part, planting went in a good shape. You know, we, we had some dry periods in between decent rainfall amounts compared to other years when we had a very dry October, for example. So, so overall, the crop is up to a decent start. Now, with that said, in some parts of the state, the rain was enough that some of the low spots of the field are actually showing already symptoms of water logging and really plants are not coming in that part of the field, right? So whenever we are, we are evaluating this need for uh, replanting, uh, we need to, to consider a few things. So first, is the stand across the entire field just thin, right? Is it? And this usually happens, for example, whenever we plant into dry soils, and that seed might reach moisture every now and then uh, within the field. And so you have a very scattered stand that instead of uh, near your 1 million plants per acre population, you end up with maybe 500,000, and they are really scattered across the field. So this happens every now and then, especially in dry soil situations, and that's one condition that we that we might have. Now, this year, that's probably not the case, again, because even though we had some dry spells every now and then, we also had uh, rainfall every 10 to 15 days that really helped the crop come along. What I'm hearing more from growers this year is low spots in the field where the plants are just not coming right, because of excessive water. And and we were seeing many fields showing those type of symptoms as we were traveling to plant our own trials, the low spots in the field just not showing uh, many plants at all. Now, in that case, the growers will have a, a large portion of the field without any plants, right? So in the first case that I told, that, that I said, if we just have a low population, but the plants are well distributed across the field, chances are that pillaring will occur and we will fill up some of those spots, So the decision to replant might be uh, harder in those situations. Now, when we are talking about low spots in the field that simply didn't emerge because the seeds were waterlogged and they perished, there are really no plants coming up, then in this case, growers will have a large portion of the field without any plants at all. And so that can really drag your yields down. So that's a type of situation where, yes, we should probably be thinking of going out there and uh, refilling those spots. Otherwise, there will be no plants over there. It's going to increase your weed pressure on those spots, and that can carry over next seasons, right, if we have uh, weeds coming out there. And simply an area without any plants there, there's no potential to compensate any any yield loss. 
One of the things that you listed in an article on this, as one goes about evaluating the situation, they can look at the stand expectations that they had uh, compared to what is showing currently, and that gets into the plants evident now per foot of row. This is detailed in the numbers, and you've covered that in the article. But talk a bit about that part of this assessment, if you would. Yeah, so what you're referring to there, Eric, is a e-update article that we published now on October 21st, so growers can go back and look at it. And there is a table where we are putting the seeding rate originally used and what was the seed size of that seed lot and how many plants we should be out there depending on your row space. Right, so, so it's, a, it's, it's essentially a way to facilitate growers going out to the field and assessing their stand. I'll give you an example. If a grower planted at 75 pounds per acre at an average seed size of 16,000 seeds per pound and an average row spacing of seven and a half, right? So just considering a, a grower in central Kansas, we should have anywhere uh, around 14 plants in a row foot, right? So very simply, if you go out there in about 12 inches of row, you should have about 14 plants. Mm-hmm. And we use that assessment to uh, help guide whether replanting is worth it or not, right? So usually, if you are near that 14 plants per row foot, again, at that seeding rate, at that seed size, and that row spacing, then we should be okay. And even if you're a little bit lower, thinking that the wheat has the potential to filler out and compensate, we should be okay. Now, if you should have 14 plants in that row food and you're seeing five to six plants or less than 50% of, of what you were originally shooting for, then definitely we should be considering replanting those spots in the field. It is an easier decision if it is kind of like the, the entire field in that same situation. Now, as I was mentioning, many of the cases that I'm coming across this year, they are more spots within the field where there's simply no plants. Right. And so the decision is easier in that case, whenever we have just like large spots in the field where there's no plants coming up because of excessive moisture. Right. Now, if it's already a relatively wet soil, well, that's going to put us sometime into November for that replanting conditions. And and Mm -hmm. that's going to offer some challenges. Right. So first, of course, replanting that late, the wheat is going to rely much more on the yield coming from those primary tillers for the main plant and the primary tiller, right? So we need to ramp up the population. First thing, if we want to maintain our yield potential, we need to increase our population just to ensure that we're going to have the necessary number of heads per square foot later on near harvest maturity. Now, where that may actually be very tricky is when it comes to weed control, right? Because uh, the different plants in that field, they're going to have different growth stages, right? So so let's say that uh, the majority of the field was actually planted sometime in early October. It's going to go into the winter on those three to five dealers. Now, whatever we're planting in November, chances are that they might go into the winter with just no tiller at all, or just that very first tiller beginning to form, depending on temperature accumulation. And so herbicide decisions are going to be more challenging because some herbicides, there are restrictions in terms of growth stage when they can be sprayed or not. Restrictions both on the early end, how how soon can you start spraying, but also on the late end, how how late can you spray. And so growers will have to be cognizant of that fact that they need to really keep a close track of where plants are in terms of uh, crop development in those early planted parts of the field and in those late planted lower spots as well. So herbicides, Weed control and herbicide application definitely will be more challenging in those fields with varying growth stages. Another important thing right there to have in mind as one contemplates this decision, and and by the way, we'd urge you to have a look at that table that Romulo referred to on the target plants per row of foot, and that really lends some insight as to what's out there and whether or not you want to replant. That's in that Agronomy E-Update article. But Romulo, if one's looking for a a (laughs) down-and-dirty break point as far as whether to replant or not. It seems to be that 50% of stand or so, and uh, on either side of that is where that decision rests. Yes, it it really depends case by case, but if growers are following our suggestions of close to 1 to 1.2 million 
seeds per acre there. They should have around a million plants emerged in those fields. If they are with about half of that stand, which is a, a, puts us at, at around 500,000 plants, definitely it might be worth going out, out or less, right? Definitely might be worth going out and, and replanting that. And again, if the field is uniformly with, with a low uh, stand like that, you just need to replant, adding another 30, 40 pounds per acre, or, or perhaps if you're in central Kansas, no more than about 50, 60 pounds per acre in terms of replanting there, mm-hmm. uh, of course, depending on seed size. Now, if it's more than that, if, if we are with uh, 600,000, 700,000 plants out there, chances are that the crop is going to tiller out and compensate, right? Now, uh, it's important to remember that a plant that will rely more on the tillers to form yield, it's usually going to be a little bit later in maturity, right? Because remember, those tillers are going to be formed later, so they will their, their entire cycle will be delayed a little bit. So maybe in a field where it emerged nicely versus a neighboring field where it did not, chances are the harvest is going to occur five, seven days later in that field where it's going to rely more on tillers as compared to the field that emerged nicely and on time. More than a few things to think about here, and uh, it's a really good read. It's entitled Replanting Decisions for Winter Wheat, the article in the e-update series. It was posted this past Thursday, the 21st of October, at agronomy.ksu.edu. It mentions other things, uh, which we won't dwell on here, such as the insurance cutoff date. That's a pretty important consideration likewise in all of this. Have a look at that article at agronomy.ksu.edu. Romulo, as always, appreciate your time. Thank you, Eric. He's a wheat production specialist with K-State Research and Extension. That's Romulo Lolato with us on this opening part of Agriculture Today. Welcome back. You're tuned to Agriculture Today. And something from the site-specific farming arena now for you as we brought by Research and Extension Precision Agricultural Engineer here at Kansas State University, A.J. Sharda. The prospects of autonomous in-field pest control systems, or to put it another way, a fleet of robots deployed for treating insects and weeds. And A.J., you and your team have been hard at it exploring the potential of these systems. Eric, thank you for, for this opportunity. Yes, how we apply chemicals in this time and age, we have lots and lots of acres to cover in a short amount of time. Site-specific autonomous, you know, smaller vehicles, which can potentially go within the rows of the crop, look at where the sites for infestation are, make a decision if the infestation is beyond a critical level, and make the decision about, yes, I'm going to spray on the site to control the pest makes complete sense to me. The technology itself is out there, right? Maybe not widely utilized commercially, but describe these further from the technical standpoint, if you would. So absolutely, you're absolutely right. There is nothing from a, from an application uh, standpoint that technology is not there. The component which is missing at this point is how do we infuse artificial intelligence to these machines so that they can go and look at the plants, see the kind of insects, how do you make decision that these insects are beyond the level that I need to spray and control them. That is what it is missing. Mm -hmm. The other piece which is missing is can we do that on a larger scale, right? So one small autonomous system, I can let it go in the field, I can manage it easily. But if I am looking to implement, you know, artificial intelligence-based site-specific control of this liquid application, I have to have lots of those little things moving around in the field uh, autonomously and working in sync with each other in a space which is shared among them. So that is where, you know, some of the challenges are. The other things which we we always talk about, that in the absence of human, you know, human's eyes are missing, human intelligence is missing, 
human feel is missing, human knowledge of his own feels are missing, right? I gather a lot of information as I go. Now I have to completely rely on that machine, which is a piece of technology, to continue feeding me every single piece of information. Piece of information from its own well-being, the safety, where it is in terms of location, the needs in terms of crop inputs, and continuously communicating all the valuable data which is which that machine is calculating. And I really want to emphasize that, that when we are uh, running a big sprayer, it's going to cover the entire field. I want data file, which has all the information about that field. Now, if in that same 100 acres, if I am running 20-odd small autonomous machines, I have to aggregate all that data on the fly to understand, have I covered the entire field? And how much pesticide I applied? You know, where do I stand in all the numbers? Whether the knowledge of insect and use of chemical, where they were all that. So having that ecosystem where these machines know where they are, these machines know where other machines are, these machines know what area has been tasked to them to operate. There, these machines know that, have I really communicated with some central hub to communicate all my data and then very intelligently talk to the human interface about their needs. So I think these are the technological innovations uh, which need to be developed so that we can present to our farming community that, hey, this is a complete business model uh, in terms of how you can operate these machines. And there are tons of scientists, and you're among them, working on ways of integrating all of that and making these systems function as a unit, if you will, although they are independent parts of that unit. But just to put this out there, what does this kind of system achieve beyond what our current precision spraying technologies do? Excellent question, you know especially the approach we are taking. And, and there are lots of people doing some amazingly excellent work in terms of their approaches. We are trying to go within the canopy and within the rows. So when I'm within the canopy, I can look at the canopy from top to bottom. Well, my interest is middle or bottom because that's where the infestation starts. And if I want to put additional cameras or additional computer vision on it, I can start to sense any deficiency in terms of the nutrition as well, which I am, if I'm on the top of the canopy, I have little chance to see. And even if I can see, I cannot do it in a very productive manner, right? Now, when I'm spraying inside, I have a microclimate, which has lesser wind effect as well, right? In the canopy, the wind effect is less. The environment is a little bit more cooler and damp. Now, I can spray from 8 or 10 inches away from the canopy, right? Or 15 inches. Let's let's example, let's see a 30-inch row spacing of corn. I'm spraying something from 15 inches up close. And on top of it, I'm making those decisions based on data, the knowledge which I am, the data I'm getting from my computer vision. So now I'm only spraying where I, I, it is needed. I'm spraying within the canopy, so the effect of wind slash drift will be very little. You know, if I'm spraying site-specific, I'm saving lots and lots of chemical. Costs are down. And the effect of excessive application of those uh, those chemicals, which are ending up in my streams and water bodies or soils, is going to be less as well, right? And more importantly, if I'm doing that, I'm catching the infestation at the right time. So I'm not letting that population build up where I have to go out and, 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 and apply. And most important thing is I'm controlling them at the right time, not where portion of the field has already been damaged or the yields has probably been or potentially will be impacted because of that. So there are lots and lots of benefit from environment, from dollar saving standpoint, you know, from you know, loss of product and drift, all those things which we talk about liquid application these days. And the sensory technology is here, that is the identifying technology, be it a weed, be it an insect infestation, right? Yes, most, there are lots of things which are already there. Individually, if you say, you know, there are already, you know, capabilities where we can, you know, we can look and tell which insect is there. 
you know we can tell you know what kind of deficiency it looks like but what we need to develop is to integrate them to kind of a uh, make the decision mm-hmm. so for example what we are doing is we have taken a use case scenario of looking at aphids sugarcane aphids in a sorghum crop now if i'm looking at a weed on a clean soil background right if i'm doing some fallow application then finding that thing is pretty easy right any green thing which is on a fallow land is a weed i can just spray it i can be more intelligent if i can identify which kind of weed it is then i will also know that which weeds are recurring year by year and do i have some resistance so that is next level of intelligence you know we have seen some see and spray thing from john deere and other companies i think that's where they are going but from a perspective of this part what we are you know going back to it the challenge is as we are moving you don't want to sit there take an image and make a decision i want to continue moving at at least 2 or 3 miles which is a lot of speed you know going through the rows right. that i can on the fly take an image identify in that whole this canopy shades and and leaves and stalks and everything and that the where the colony of aphids are training this and building these computer algorithms that's the task if you can do that lots of other pieces are already in place then how far are we from these systems becoming at least modestly common in production agriculture do you think Yes and <laughs> so putting that, you on the spot. Yeah, that. that's a million dollar question, <laughs> but um I I think more and more people are realizing that uh autonomous vehicles uh are something which lots of companies can quickly uh get in in terms of development and there are lots of startups who have really good small autonomous systems, you know, sorry, you know, uh, vehicles. and i i can tell that uh, we are at a stage where we took our vehicle for the first time out on the field okay. and we actually sprayed that so if in a five year project we in our third year we are taking that system out and spraying uh, i'm very confident that our algorithm will be up and running you know this year as well so if we can prove that system to this level in this much time um there are lots of people are looking at us and similar kind of people who are working in their area to jump on to work with those people who can show that hey here is a proof of concept and i can show it works now it needs to be cleaned up and make you know ready for operation you're enthused about it in yes. that respect yes and the best of luck in furthering that work good conversation here aj again we appreciate the update thank, thank you. you he's aj sharda He's a precision agricultural engineer, K-State Research and Extension, and commenting right there on the work ongoing here at K-State, and more broadly in the agricultural technology field, developing autonomous systems for addressing pest problems in standing crops. You're listening to Agriculture Today with more on the K-State Radio Network. coming your way now on agriculture today this week's horticulture segment and with yet another roundup on insect activity in lawn and garden yes we're well into the fall but there are still a few things to bring to your attention homeowners and gardeners raymond cloyd good enough to be back by with us today k state research and extension horticultural entomologist well raymond some new things this time around we've not brought up before spruce spider mites Spruce trees are challenged by our weather extremes in this region anyway, but the spider mites just add to that stress, you say. Yeah, Eric, there are two mites that we have here in Kansas, the cool season mite, which is the spruce spider mite, and the warm season mite, which is two spotted spider mite. So now, as everybody's experiencing cooler temperatures in general, the spruce spider mite is going to be active, feeding on spruce and thuya and conifers. And what you'll see is some bronzing of the older growth. distortion of the tips and if you see that you can just take a sheet of white paper over the clipboard shake the branches and you'll see the 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 red mites on there and one of the easiest things is to take a high pressure water spray and just dislodge them blast them off there's really no need to apply any miticide or anything like that initially if they get really bad you might want to apply like a mineral oil or something but uh, this is the time of year when the uh, spruce spider mite is out it'll overwinter on the plant 
And the benefit of that is you can use dormant oils during the, the winter to spray your plants and uh, kill the eggs. So um, check your, your conifers, especially your thuyas, arborvitas, and you know look for bronzing or uh, just shakes and branches over a white piece of paper attached to cardboard and see what, see what's there. Here's a name we haven't encountered, maybe at all before, White Line Sphinx. What are those, Raymond? Yeah, uh, White Line Sphinx are out right now. These are those uh, moths that look like hummingbirds. They kind of, they fly, they fly just, their movements are like a hummingbird, and they take their long mouth part of proboscis, and they're sipping nectar. They're quite abundant. I've been out several places, and on, on certain shrubs, I've seen like five to ten of them. Uh, the caterpillars are, are big. They look like tomato tobacco hornworm, but they're not. They do have a horn, um, but the larval stage is also feeds on plants. Now, the adult moths are not damaging, but they're just a very, they're a curiosity. You'll probably notice them on things like pentas and uh, petunias and uh, salvia, th- things like that flying around. But they really don't deserve treatment, you don't think? Oh, they're, they're not a pest. Uh, well, the caterpillars might be, but the adults are not. They're just something to to watch nature in action. (laughs) Very good. Those are called the white line sphinx, once again, for reference purposes. Squash bugs in the garden? We do, especially during pumpkin season, because the adults and nymphs will feed on pumpkins. So really, it's difficult to think about taking action now. And remember that uh, a way to deal with squash bug for next year is clean up all your debris. The adults overwinter in the debris. So after all the cucurbits are, are died back and everything, clean everything up, and that will remove the hiding places for the adults during the winter time. Not just for squash bugs. In general terms, a good cleanup of the garden, if you're finished for the year, would be in order to alleviate all number of problems. Yes, not only for insects and mice, but diseases too. Yeah, you know, the old adage, cleanliness is next to godliness, uh, does play a factor here. Sanitation is really important. And like you said, Eric, it isn't just for the uh, squash bug adults, but some other insects and, and even mites that are out there. One last management step to mention here, and it's good for a variety of reasons, and that is making sure that your landscape ornamentals are well cared for in the fall and winter when it tends to turn off dry. Assuring that they have adequate water will go a long way to uh, preserving their health and their defenses against insects, for one thing. Eric, that is very true. You cannot allow trees and shrubs to go through the winter under dry conditions because the the wind is still out there and they'll succumb to winter injury. Also, uh, they'll be stressed, wood-boring insects. We'll hone in on them. And so be sure you give your trees and shrubs a deep watering so they don't go through the winter in a dry condition. Yeah. Good point to part on here. Raymond, a pleasure as always. Thank you. Always enjoy it, Eric. Look forward to our next uh, meeting. That's horticultural entomologist Raymond Cloyd, K-State Research and Extension, on this week's horticulture segment, bringing our Thursday edition to a close. Thanks for listening. Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.